Good afternoon. We break from our regular programming of building the world's most ridiculously over-engineered plywood boxes so that we can go and build something completely different. Now I know some of you may be thinking, why is Damien getting distracted and building something completely irrelevant? We don't need a grass-powered helicopter or a carbon-neutral worm farm. What I am building though is actually something very relevant. Very relevant indeed. There's something missing on Brewpeg. What appears to be a 50 litre stainless keg is actually a veggie oil heater. So what I need to build is the ability to heat 50 litres of veggie oil so we can run our main engine on the dyno. Yes, that's right, we're going to the dyno. We've taken a sunken fishing trawler and converted her to a community funded expedition and research boat crewed by volunteers from around the world. Because life's too short not to fight for your dream. Alright, why am I doing this? So, diesel runs at ambient temperature and below zero, that sort of thing. Veggie oil does not. Veggie oil needs to be above a certain temperature to have the same viscosity or runniness as diesel. That temperature is about 80 degrees Celsius. No idea what that is in Fahrenheit. So I need to create something that's going to lift the temperature of the oil from the ambient temperature that we start with up to about 80 degrees or more. It can go up to about 100, 110 degrees Celsius, but 80 degrees above is fine. My plan is to basically create a boiler. It's not going to bubble the oil, but it's going to lift that temperature up and we're going to recycle it into the engine. So the engine will be sucking from that tank and then the return will be dumping back in. So hot fuel will be coming back in. After a while, we can actually turn the boiler off and it'll just self-generate its own heat based on the engine temperature. But we need to get it up to 80 degrees to start with. So we only had a couple of days to come up with this whole thing, design it, build it, and hit the road and get to Brisbane. Um, we had very short notice about the dyno timeline. So we're working to a pretty strict sort of timeline to get this built and tested before we hit the road. I was going to use a keg because they're a simple, easy, clean 316 stainless tank. They're cheap and there's plenty of them available at the scrapyard. So that's what we did this morning. That was the keg run. The next thought I had was actually building it a bit like a hot water cylinder. We've got an immersion heating element inside the oil and then that gradually lifts the temperature up and you can thermostat control it. A lot of this was actually pointed out by a patron of ours, Lee. Um, that was my initial thought, was actually building it like that. Um, he's got some experience in commercial cookers and things where they have a lot more control over that sort of stuff and there's a lot of pros to go that way, like, um, you know, versus like say gas or whatever. So that we can get a rough idea how much water we're putting in, we've got a flow meter. So let me show you what this does. This is the old engine block out of Brewpeg. We're driving this down and giving it to Carl, and then we're dynoing the new engine he's just built for Brewpeg. All packed up, ready to go. So taking the block and the sump and a whole bunch of oil and a bunch of other parts, camera gear and stuff down to Brisbane. Let's go and get this thing dynoed. So I'm heading down to Brisbane. I'll stay with Duncan tonight, and then Duncan and I will head to the dyno tomorrow morning to get this thing fired up. So we've arrived at the dyno. The engine is all set up. So it's not painted, it gets painted after we do the dyno run. And that way if there's any sort of leaks or anything that needs to be corrected, that can happen now and then paint is the last thing. There was a little leak that happened just up here. This tapper cover wasn't quite spot on, so tapper cover's been changed. Leak should be good to go. But you can sort of see everything that's been done to it. We've got new harmonic balancer down here. Um, obviously new belts, new water pumps, all of the Everything's been cleaned up, so you can see how your rocker box is aluminium, your cylinder head's cast iron. This has all been acid bath. This here's been um, bead blasted, same with the, the intercooler. So everything's looking lovely and schmick. Um, sump is a different sump, so the sump was swapped over. All of the pipes are all new. So this is the beautiful, beautiful engine that was um, basically given to Brewpeg as a result of the generosity so of everybody that's helped with the GoFundMe. So on this side you can see there's a lovely new starter motor in there. This is our um, the oil cooler up here, oil filter. We may remote mount this or we may not. It'd be nice if we don't have to do it, but we may end up doing that. Um, turbo, we had to get a new turbo, so there's a lovely big Garrett turbo sitting there. You can sort of see how shiny and new it is. <laughs> Huge big thing that it is. All right, and then the dyno. So engine connects directly to the dyno. Dyno is basically just a big brake, so it applies load and it's water cooled. So this dyno has a couple of big pipes, a couple of pumps and a, and a whole bunch of water. And essentially it's using that water to take the heat out. So this is a, essentially a water cooled brake. And then that's the cooling system for it over there. The cooling system for the engine is that big fan over there. That's a, um, 
a great big radiator. You can sort of see it's like a maybe a truck radiator or like a dump truck radiator or something. But you've got cooling water that comes up to the various pipes on the engine and then off to that to make sure that we maintain the right temp. Uh, over the back, so we've got our little control room over the back there, so that's where we sit when the engine's running and we can look at all the details. But one of the things we have to do first is get our hot water cylinder heater thing up and running so that we can get our veggie oil into the engine. So we can't run the engine on veggie oil until we've got the oil up to at least 80 degrees Celsius. So we're going to run the engine on diesel, get it all up to operating temperature and do all of the power runs on diesel, and then we're going to swap it over. Okay, we'll see what that looks like. Yep. Oh, you've got, oh, you got a scribe, haven't you? Yep. Ooh, there we go, first one. So there's there's four litres. Yep. So right. let's do a real robust mark because I don't know how will. much is going to show up. So every four litre, we've got four litre containers, every four litres we're putting a mark on a stick and that's our flow gauge. We don't have a flow gauge on this dyno, so we're doing an analog gauge. You come around late at night looking for some arms to hug and hold you tight Well I've got two of those Strong as they can be Water temp at 49 degrees. We've got exhaust temp at 178 degrees. This valve here basically feeds water into the dyno, which increases load. So that's essentially our load ability. And then we've got horsepower, torque, RPM, and then we'll start seeing them on the graphs when we start doing the power run. You might be able to see the thermals happening down in there. This is the pure canola oil that we're heating up to make sure that we can get it up to at least 80 degrees Celsius before we can run it. This engine is built to make 350 horsepower and we're making above that on diesel. This is that same power run from the outside and you can start to hear the engine wind up and the turbo start to scream. Waiting to get the veggie oil up to temp, up to at least 80 degrees Celsius. The engine's up to operating temp, it's running beautiful, it's producing good horsepower. 
that's on diesel, so we're about to swap it over and see what it does on vehicle oil. I want to introduce you to someone that's played an absolutely enormous role in the background of getting this engine up and running, and he hasn't been on the camera much, but he's critical to making sure this works. Carl Giesman, he's the man that's rebuilt this 855, as well as thousands of 855s before it. He's probably one of the, the experts in terms of putting these together in Australia. He's probably one of the leading people. So it's been an absolute privilege to be able to work with him. But I wanted to talk to him about what he's done specifically to this engine and then also what they do to run an engine like this in on the dyno. Hi, I'm Carl. Um, yeah, so I do commercial um, Cummins engine rebuilds. Yeah, this is a Chinese 400 horsepower um, SDC engine that we've changed to fixed time. So we've changed the injectors, the cam, um, and on top of that, the whole engine's been reconditioned. Carl was just saying there's actually not much left of the original engine from what was delivered to Carl to what we've got in front of us. So like, what, what was changed? Like maybe from the top to the bottom, what do we actually modify? Um, well, basically all the bolt-ons. It's the original block, crank, rods, heads, the rocker boxes, the flow housing, but basically everything else has been changed. <laughs> yeah. Either due to uh, respec or yeah. Um, so what's the sump, needing repair? What's the sump originally off? Uh, so that's a marine sump. Okay, but cool. that was also used in industrial and, and right. truck applications as well. So yeah. originally this had a tin sump, wasn't it? And we yeah. swapped it to the yep. alloy sump. But cool. the alloy lasts longer. Yeah. Corrosion. Right. So we've got to, we got okay. So we've changed the sump. Then the pistons themselves. The pistons are the standard compression ratio pistons. Yep. Cool. The injectors. Um, injectors same. So the whole engine's built to a 700 CPL marine engine. Okay, awesome. Yep. And the cam profile and everything's obviously modified to suit the injectors to suit that CPL. Yeah, yep. So Carl just mentioned 700 CPL, and what that means is critical parts list. So 700 CPL means that any Cummins engineer or anyone that's got access to the Cummins parts catalog, etc., can know every single part of this engine. So everything from how to tune it up to how to run it in to what sort of hours you need to do certain maintenance on and so on. So it's really critical that this engine is put together to a particular CPL, doesn't matter which one it is, so long as it's a common CPL, rather than it just being a random hodgepodge of parts, of which it's absolutely not, it's built to a very specific set of um, you know, recommendations from Carl, and this allows anyone in the world to be able to maintain this engine, it also gives us a really detailed list of how to maintain this engine going forward, so it's a super critical part of keeping this engine in good nick. So some of the issues that you found inside the motor, so we had the original after cooler was kind of cactus, pretty, wasn't it? Pretty tatty, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was a lot of corrosion. It's copper yeah. um, cooling, and there was a lot of corrosion and stuff, and it looked a bit dodgy. So yeah, that this wasn't bottom used. housing's the same, but yep. the top housing and the core got changed. Okay, there was corrosion in the bottom of the liners, like the in the block itself. In the block itself. So that's been machined for. 2040 yep. oversized liners. Okay, cool. So yeah, oversized at the top, and then and then it's standard at the bottom, isn't uh, it? Ah, yeah. So yeah, the lower yeah, yeah. inserts were re-sleeved yep. in the A-ring positions. Nice. So basically, what caused that was not running coolant. So um, it destroyed the back of the liners as well as as the block where the, where the ceiling faces are on the block. It sort of like had crevice corrosion and destroyed that. So um, you essentially bore the hole out bigger. So where the liners go down, you bore the hole out bigger, and then you put a sleeve of cast iron in and bore it back to the size, machine it back to the size that it should be, the original size. So you're essentially repairing the damage of not running coolant. Yeah, turbo is different, suit the different spec. A new water pump, all things like the piping for here and here and the elbows, everything was all water damaged, so that was all changed. Yep. Um, new core in the oil cooler. Yep. Vibration damper's new. Uh, manifold's been machined and pressure tested on both sides. Yeah, lovely. New thermostat, new oil feed hose. Those hoses look awesome. Yeah. They look great with it. Yeah, well that's the original one. It's just been through the acid, so it yeah. just eats all the paint off it. And yeah, yeah, nice, nice. But the feed hose, it's got oil pressure. I like to change them with a new one, just yep. for safety's sake. Fair enough. Yep. When you've got an engine like this and you've rebuilt it, how do you like to run them in on a dyno to make sure that you've got the best of the longevity for that engine? Well, first thing we do is start it up, let it idle, just walk around, check for leaks, um, then bring it up to about 1200 RPM, put light load on it, so about 50 horsepower, and just let it sit there till the thermostat opens, make sure it opens at the right temp. Um, and then from there, we just step it up 25% of the time. You go sort of 125 and then 250 and then just step it up like that, up to full horsepower, just give it half an hour in between. And so what's the, why, why do this? What's the point of running an engine in? Like what's the benefit of just, rather than just say rebuild it, throw it in a truck and off you go, drive down the road? Oh, it's quality control. You can leave, you know, there's no leaks, it makes horsepower, the, there's no, no smoke, 
like everything's right when it leaves. So what happens inside an engine? You've just rebuilt it. What happens when you run an engine in? Is there any changes that happen inside the engine when that's happening? Um, yeah, so all the metal parts, like the rings, liners, pistons, everything sort of beds in. And the engine actually generates quite a bit of metal um, in that run-in process. So after the dyno, we take the oil filter off, cut it open, inspect it, just make sure there's nothing abnormal going on in there. This is the first startup on veggie oil. So this is the exhaust. You'll see how much smoke, etc., comes out of it. So we've got diesel in the fuel lines. So there's probably, I don't know, a couple of litres all up maybe of fuel, of actual diesel sitting in there. But once that cycles through, we'll start getting into veggie oil. We're going to get it to 1500 revs. It was about 200-ish horsepower. And we're just going to see how it all behaves just on veggie. And then we'll start doing some power runs. Yep. So this is the return line here. We're just waiting. You can see there's a different colour from the diesel. The oil's quite sort of tan colour. And then the diesel's got a bit of a purpley bluey tinge. We're just waiting until that colour clears up. We know that we've got no diesel sitting in the lines. Still looking very diesel light. We think we've got veg oil flowing in now, so we're not seeing a huge amount of diesel come out. But the revs dropped about 20 revs and sort of came back up. And there's a little waft to smoke coming out of it now. That wasn't there before. So we'll see how we go. Definitely veg oil now. All right, should we do some power runs? Yep, sweet. 1500 RPM. Putting on a bit more load. The smoke you can see is because the oil's too cold at the engine, but we didn't realise that yet. 1450, 1430 RPM. Under load, a diesel should run absolutely crystal clear. Anything less than that, like what you can see out of the exhaust right now, there's something going on, and in this case, the fuel is cold. We need to adjust that in order to clean the exhaust emissions up. 150 horsepower, 1400 RPM. Just going to bring it up about 1500. One of the reasons we wanted to run veggie oil on the dyno is to remove subjectivity. We want to know what we can and can't do with this engine. And right now, we're learning very quickly that the amount of temperature in the oil drum drops very rapidly by the time it gets to the engine, and the engine doesn't like it and produces a lot of smoke. One of the first lessons that we learnt was how critical veggie oil temperature was. In the container just in front of Duncan, it was around about 100 degrees Celsius. By the time it got to the engine, it was about 80 degrees Celsius. So anything above 80 is acceptable, but the hotter the oil got, the better the engine ran, and the cleaner the smoke. This is at full power. You can just see there's not a jot coming out of this thing. It's absolutely beautifully clean. And it just got better and better as the day went, as we learnt more about this oil temperature um, ratio that we have to keep. We wanted to know if there was a difference in fuel consumption from veggie oil to diesel. So one of the tests we did was holding a consistent horsepower, RPM and all of the other parameters and leaving it run for 30 minutes and then measuring how much fuel we had gone through on both fuels. This gauge is monitoring our engine temp, 78.5 degrees Celsius and exhaust temp, 402 degrees Celsius. Thank you to everybody that donated for the GoFundMe to get this engine up and running, and thank you to our Patreons that have got Brewpeg this far. If you'd like to become a Patreon and get exclusive extended cut episodes, join us at our Patreon-only roundtable live feed, where we make decisions about the project together and you get early access. Join us on Patreon, there's a link in the description below. If that's not possible and you'd like to support the project in any way that you can, don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Thanks for watching, we really appreciate it.
this is running at cruise RPM. So we're maybe a little bit above it. We're 1500 RPM and we're running at about 200 horsepower. So we're gonna run this at, for half an hour at this speed and see exactly how much fuel we burn. And then we'll do a different speed and it'll give us a, a, an ability to graph the fuel burn on this. So at the same settings with diesel, we were getting just over 200 horsepower and we're getting about 173, 174 on veggie oil. So that was our start. One, two, three, four, four and a half. So we're just swapping it back over to diesel. This is it idling. So the plan is, we're just about out of oil, so the plan is we're going to swap it over to diesel, do the power runs on diesel, which is this blue drum just here, uh, Duncan and me are going to rip down and grab some more oil and then we'll do the full power runs on some new oil. You can see it gets a wee bit smoky when the oil is a bit cold. We're swapping between oil and diesel right now and the oil is getting a wee bit cold. So that's about 900 RPM. I know that because of the rattle that happens in the dyno at 900 RPM. So what we're waiting for is when we can see diesel coming out of this return line in the tank here. And when that happens, we're going to dump the diesel oil mix into these containers. And then we know that we've flushed the, the veggie oil out of the fuel lines. And then we can we know that we're running on diesel for our test. So you can see Carl's checking every now and again the oily consistency. And we, there we go. And when you can sort of smell the diesel come through, that's when we swap it out. might even see the oil and the diesel start separating out in these containers. So we took a break from the dyno for a bit so that we can get some more veggie oil. While we're out on the road we went to Carl's workshop so that we can unload the 855 block that was originally in Brewpeg. This was the engine that we pulled out recently and Carl's going to keep this as a spare block for somebody that needs a new one. So we've done the cruise run on veggie oil. We're going to do exactly the same test running straight diesel and that'll give us a comparison between how much fuel burn we get running oil versus diesel. Don't necessarily know what the result's going to be yet, so we'll see how that goes. And then we're going to do a full power run on diesel, so we know how many litres per hour we're burning on diesel. We think it's going to be about 60, 63, something like that, at full power per hour. Um, and then we're going to do a swap back to veggie oil. Normally you'd hook it up on veggie oil and just run it like that, but we actually ran out of veggie oil, so that's why we're doing the flicking back from one fuel to the next. So we're gonna get the engine back up to the temperature and then we're gonna start that power run. We've just done the full power run, so it was 363 horsepower, but over a thousand foot pound of torque, 1080, something like that. Uh, we managed to get a fuel burn rate of 60 litres per hour, so one litre per minute is what we're burning at full throttle on this engine. Um, we're not going to go anywhere near that when we're cruising, we'll be half, maybe even less than half of that, um, 20 to 30 litres, something like that. 
Uh, but now we're going to do the swap over to veg oil. So we've got our veg oil sitting at 95 degrees, so nice and hot and crispy, ready to go. So we're going to flush the lines out, and then we're going to do a full power burn uh, for about five minutes to get our fuel burn rate for veggie oil, see if there's any difference. Bit of a laser zap. So 48 on the side, 38 there. Too hot to measure. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Okay, so it's over 100. This thing freaks out at 100 degrees. So we've got very hot oil, which is perfect for what we need. So we're doing the swap over. So our return line is going into this um, four litre. We're gonna drain as much diesel as we can out of the system, and then we'll put that into the tank, but our pickup is gonna be coming from oil. So we have straight oil going into the engine. We'll have a mix of diesel and oil coming out of the engine into these bottles. Um, and then once we've got what we, what we think is pretty much straight oil coming out of the engine, then we're gonna put the return back into this drum. So this is the full horsepower run on veggie oil, straight veggie oil. So on veggie oil, we're seeing just over 350 horsepower at 1800 RPM. The exhaust temp is 467 degrees and engine temp is 81.8 degrees. So this is a full power run on canola oil. Oil is about 90 degrees, 95 degrees, something like that. Engine's running beautiful, but the thing I really want to show you, look how clean that exhaust is. So, when you're running on canola oil, the exhaust on this thing is just absolutely crystal clear. When you're on diesel, there's a slight tinge of smoke, but huge, in terms of cleanliness, hugely cleaner running on oil compared to diesel. Here yeah, Duncan's just measuring off exactly how much fuel we've used on our patented fuel dipping stick. This will tell us how much we've burnt over the time to run. We just did the numbers. I'm out here so that I can actually think. Um, full power is 350 horsepower on oil, 360 on diesel. Um, same talk. Uh, the fuel burn on diesel is 60 litres flat per hour, one litre per minute. Uh, on oil, it's 72 litres per hour at full power. So, slightly less power on oil, much cleaner exhaust, and cheaper fuel overall. Right, so we had a pretty awesome day at the dyno yesterday. Um, we spent all day there. We were there from nine in the morning, we left about three. Um, we we're just doing run after run, testing various different things on oil and on diesel. Um, and we, we came away with some pretty interesting takeaways from what we saw. Um, some of it was expected and some of it was sort of blew our, our thoughts as to you know what what it would be like oil was obviously always going to be the big thing of you know what does it do and how how good or bad is it um it's the first time i've ever run oil in an engine myself um i've done a lot of research and sort of understood the theory of it but i've and i know that it's been done thousands of times but it's the first time that i've ever been able to really test it and it was awesome to be able to test it on the dyno because there's no subjectivity. It is or it isn't, it's black and white. Um, and some of the numbers that we came away with were pretty cool. So the engine is built to CPL 700. So for any, any Cummins people out there, that's, that's a particular type of spec that puts all of the various options and variable parts, et cetera, together in one combo to create a 350 horsepower engine. The headline numbers of that are, it's built to, to produce 350 horsepower continuously all day, every day at 1800 revs. So we could run that motor, turn it on and run it for six, seven weeks without stopping the motor um, at 1800 revs and produce that power all day, every day. Um, on the dyno on diesel, the maximum horsepower that we saw was 366. So it's slightly overperforming what the, the spec of the engine is built for. Um, the maximum revs that we saw was close to 2100, I think it was. So these engines can rev that high in certain specs, and at one point it did go up to that, um, but almost all of the time was spent at a peak of 1800 RPM, which is what we all have in the boat. We won't be taking it over that RPM. The uh, peak torque figure that we saw was 1065 uh, foot-pound of torque, which is, how much was that in newton meters? So you turn it cruise or full power? Oh, full power. Oh, full power. Okay, so we've got 1,438 newton meters. Yeah, so lots of them. Um, and that's going through a four to one reduction on the gearbox. So times those numbers by four, and that's the torque that the propeller shaft sees. So uh, there's a huge amount of torque coming out of this engine to spin that prop. It's a big propeller. 
Um, it's 46 inches diameter and there's four big blades. But what's more important to us is the cruise speed. So we want to optimize the motor for cruise speed. So for us, that's between 1300 and 1450 RPM in, a, in that sort of narrow range of RPM. Guess what an amazing day it was yeah. on the dyno. And I've been around dynos before, um, more as an electrical engineer than a mechanical engineer, um, but it was a pretty special day in that this was the brew peg motor yeah. engine sitting on, on the dyno there. And as Damien said, there were probably a few big um, takeaways there. Um, I was really amazed at the performance of the veg oil, and we'll get through that uh, in, in just, just it was, a second. It was, it was staggering. It was, it, yeah, very much so. Um, and the other thing should point out is in measuring the performance of the motor, Carl would set it up. We did basically 10 minute runs, which was largely governed by the volume of fuel that we had uh, available to us. Uh, he would set, depending whether it's um, uh, full load or cruise, he'd set the RPM, set the load, so these become uh, fixed numbers. And really the thing we're measuring in terms of performance, while we're keeping an eye on exhaust uh, gas temperature and uh, MAP, uh, so, mean, uh, so manifold pressure, really the performance came down to the fuel burn yeah. uh, from our point of view. All the other numbers were set to be uh, static. And also bearing in mind this, this was still forming part of the run-in cycle. There was a lot of running in happening the day before. Um, and even during the day yesterday, you could just tell a little bit of difference between morning and afternoon mm. where, where clearly that was um, continuing. The, the engine was getting better and better as the day went on, as it, as it ran in and had some load on it and so on. It was, it was getting better and better. It yeah, was great. and as Carl pointed out, Damien mentioned that 1,400 to, uh, well, around the 1,450 RPM as being the, the sweet cruise, uh, cruise RPM. And you could just hear the turbo uh, mm. kicking in there, and that's, that's what Carl was suggesting we should be aiming for for cruise. So much below that, you really couldn't hear or see uh, yeah. much, much boost from the turbo. The engine was just beautifully balanced. You just, you know, the expressions yeah. purred like a kitten. It did. It purred like it was, a kitten. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, there was no harshness to full load. It was working hard. You can, you could tell that. The, the turbo was fairly screaming at that point. Now you could hear that, but certainly under cruise. Uh, yeah, you'd, be, you'd happily sit in the engine room next to the motor. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's smooth as, so yeah. really, really impressive. Carl set up as the, as the input, so he tuned the engine to run at around 1,460 RPM. That was the, the number he was chasing for revs. Uh, with, all, with all the runs, Carl set uh, a, a, a number of the, the variables here, which I guess doesn't make them variables anymore. Yeah. Um, but for all runs, uh, he targeted uh, for crews. 1,460 uh, RPM, and basically what he's doing is he's setting the load, uh, and at the same time he's, he's controlling the throttle. So between the two, uh, we could set constant figures uh, yeah. for comparison between the two fuels. We saw 173 horsepower, uh, this is for cruise, as being common between the two fuels. It pretty much setting up the, um, the torque at around 620 uh, foot-pounds or 840 newton meters. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, measuring the respective fuel flows, so that was really how we're measuring the performance between the two fuels. We had uh, 35 litres per hour, and that was for... That was on. That was actually running on veggie oil. That was on the veggie oil yeah, one? Yeah, so 16% yep. so less would be the diesel number. Yes. Yeah. The other thing we noticed when we did the first veggie oil uh, run, uh, and Damien had set up the, uh, the veggie oil heater, and so we got that up to uh, 80 degrees and then started the run, uh, so a few things learned there, and that is they're quite long uh, fuel lines, uh, probably, I don't know, three metres or so. And by the time the fuel gets to the other ends, we did notice that it cooled down that little bit. So we, we basically, it took a while to make sure they had the veg oil up yeah. to temperature at the engine end. We, we also figured out it took about 10 minutes uh, for the fuel lines to fully purge yep. from one fuel to the other. Uh, and just as the new fuel, whether it be diesel or veg oil, hit the engine, Carl could just see on the, on the taco, you could just see a little bit yeah. of a change there. Outside, you could just hear, I wouldn't even say hiccup, but you could just tell there was a momentary change in tone, and then, yeah. then you wouldn't notice the difference yeah. after that. We did notice while that uh, veggie oil was probably not up to temperature, perhaps a little bit of, um, yeah. I'll say, soot difference. But the, the, the biggest thing that we noticed was how well the engine ran on oil and how clean it burnt. So on, so that, so to put it in context, the engine runs absolutely beautifully on diesel and it's very, very clean by diesel standards. It's an incredibly clean exhaust. Um, you have to remember this engine is, uh, it's a 2011 engine, but the design is from the 70s. So it's an old design. It's not like a brand new, you know, Volkswagen diesel or, or whatnot that burns really beautifully. There's always gonna be some sort of discoloration and, and um, 
uh, like diesel smoke color sort of thing in the exhaust. So running on diesel, this thing is is very very clean um, for for what it is for the engine it is and everything. Um, you do notice a bit of a puff of diesel if you put the put your foot down. You notice a puff of diesel with the unburnt diesel coming out that clears up within half a second. When you're when you're under constant load and this thing's really humming away and there's you know it's really thumping out power, it is burning really clean on diesel. Then you switch to oil, and it's it's like a transformation. Like it, it, the exhaust goes absolutely crystal clear and the only thing you can see coming out of it is heat um, and and interestingly enough when you walk behind the exhaust when it's burning veggie oil it literally smells like hot canola oil in a, in a frying pan it smells like just that smell of canola that ever so slight smell of canola in the atmosphere um, it, it doesn't smell like a diesel engine at all um, and that was a thing that that was the biggest thing I noticed and the reason I noticed it is because that really matters to Jess because her um, health conditions and everything make her really sensitive to diesel soot and diesel smoke. Yeah, you know, I was always expecting a, uh, a I, I guess, a, a more noticeable uh, detraction in the performance of the engine. That really didn't happen. No. We've got about a 16-70% uh, penalty in terms of fuel burn yeah. with the canola, but then the economics part of that works out because where you're going yeah. to source that from eventually, yeah. it's yeah. well and truly really, uh, pay for that. Yeah. And the bottom line is when you know this thing's set up for cruise under either diesel or or um, uh, veggie oil, uh, all the parameters can be set up to be constant. Uh, so in terms of you know the revs and therefore the, the torque and the power, yeah. uh, that'll all be constant. Uh, and the only thing we notice is, is really the fuel burn. And uh, then you can get onto the jokes about quick cooking a piece of fish behind the uh, yeah, exhaust yeah. of uh, the veggie oil. Thanks for watching. And thanks for being a part of this journey. And thanks to the generosity of our community. This is only possible because of our Patreons and everybody that contributed to the GoFundMe that helped us get to the stage of having a beautiful engine to put into Brewpeg, a new gearbox, and the ability to be able to show this to the world. This is something that's an absolute dream come true on our end. It's a once in a lifetime experience, as, as Duncan pointed out earlier. Every, every part of this is a once in a lifetime experience for us, and it's because of you guys that this is possible, so thank you. It's getting very close. The whole thing's getting very close. So I've just pulled over on the side of the road. I'm driving back from Brisbane back to the boat, and I wanna give you an, a real inkling into what it's like rebuilding an engine with someone as capable as Carl. So a lot of people were questioning, why did we choose a rebuilt engine versus buying a brand new engine? There's $4,000 difference between a rebuilt engine and a brand new engine. New engine being 48,000, rebuilt being around about 44,000, give or take a little bit just for incidentals. Um, it's not about money, it's about quality of engine. So, yesterday we were on the dyno, the engine was running beautiful, we were happy. From a customer's point of view, we, we signed it off. We said, yep, that's amazing, love it, love the work, thanks very much, let's get the boat and the motor together and let's get that boat into the sea. So the deal was done. As far as Carl concern, was concerned, he could have signed that off and sent it out the door and be done. Paint the engine and, and you know, not his problem after that. But he sent me a video, it was just a video of the um, engine on the dyno again. And I thought that's odd, it's, you know, the following day, like, you know, the deal's done as far as I thought, you know. Um, and it was running really well and, you know, burning clean and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, what's going on there? So, um, so he gave me a phone call hands-free if you're, you know, police force in Australia, I have hands-free in the car. Um, he gave me a phone call and uh, we were just going through what, what, you know, had changed or anything. And he said, the engine was running within spec yesterday. It was producing 17 pounds of boost with the um, Garrett turbo that was on there. But 17 pounds is at the bottom end of the acceptable range. And he said, I wasn't happy with it. It wasn't burning as clean as I wanted. This engine should burn absolutely crystal clear on diesel. And it wasn't doing that. It had a very slight tinge. And like I'm talking tiny slight tinge of diesel at full power. Um, and he said, no, you can do better than that. So he pulled a brand new turbo off our engine, the Garrett turbo. And he put another brand new turbo that's a whole set, a different brand. Um, that, and then started running the engine up. He got 20 pounds of boost out of the whole set compared to 17 from the Garrett. Um, and the combustion improved and therefore we have crystal clear exhaust smoke when we're running at absolute full power um, with this new turbo. So that's one of the major reasons why we wanted to rebuild with someone like Carl. Not only is he just incredibly skilled at doing this, but he goes above and beyond when it comes to making sure that we get the absolute best engine we could. If that was a new engine, technically the manufacturer could say, no, it's within spec, it's fine. And we would have an engine that is not as perfect as it could be. But Carl's not like that. Because it's a rebuilt engine, you can spec every single part. And he said, no, we can get it to the top of the acceptable spec range. Changed out the turbo and did that. 
So it's a real good window into why we rebuilt versus buying new. A lot of people think new is better. In a lot of circumstances, it's great, but in our circumstance, a rebuild is head and shoulders a better engine than a brand new engine.